Howdy, folks. Hi. So I'm going to be doing a quick talk on uh, soft robotics. Um, I'm a researcher in soft robotics. I own a company called Super Releaser, where uh, we're developing open source ways to make uh, essentially biomimetic robots very simple. So the usual idea is, you know, you have a problem. It's an engineering problem, black box, input, output. And oftentimes the solutions to those are finite elements. It needs a hinge, and it needs a power source, and it needs wiring, and it needs some source of computation, and et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. And these are each their own subgroups of little things that can be subjected to finite element analysis. And that's very useful for building a robust robot. But that actually ignores a set of engineering problems that have been solved amply by nature, which is garbage in positive output problems, where you have an arbitrary environment it could be rocky, it could be snowy, it could be, you know, you're gripping one of a thousand different devices or objects, you know, different pieces of fruit. And the problem is how do you take arbitrary inputs, arbitrary environments, arbitrary, you know, aquatic conditions where there are different pressures and vectors and temperatures and turn that into directed output. And the way that this is solved through most of most of nature, not all of nature, but through most of nature is through having dynamic soft interstitched systems that are some hard parts, some soft parts, they all lean on each other, they all serve multiple purposes, and engineering those in a traditional framework is hard. It's hard to do that with a bunch of hinges and welded components and a chassis. So although we're still in the infancy of this field, there are a lot of promising solutions even early on, and what I'm hoping to present to you is an argument for why you should go out and hack on some of the open source versions that are out there to play with and experiment for yourself because they're currently getting lower and lower costs and they're getting higher and higher yield. So what is a soft robot? Um, since it's fairly new as a field, howdy, no worries, go ahead. So since it's fairly new as a field, soft robotics is like most artistic movements, most you know uh, intellectual movements, it's distinguishing itself by difference. It's not, soft robotics is exactly this. When you do this and this, precisely you know you have a soft robot. Mostly it's about contrast between traditional robotics. Sometimes it's called compliant robotics. The idea that you don't have a series of hard mechanisms that each have a known bend radius, a known amount of force, but you, you try and link up all of the systems together to create something usually using soft materials like rubber, oftentimes using uh, flexures or plastic components that are meant to bend in tandem, that you actually have a total system mechanism that you uh, do complex body calculation. If you want to simulate it, you do complex body calculation. But in many cases, since they're modeled in CAD and can be generated, molds can be generated for these through 3D printing, it's often more efficient than doing complex multi-body stretching, twisting, inflation calculations and simulations in like MATLAB. It's often more efficient to prototype an idea, 3D print it, and just make it. So what is it good for? Um, this is a this is a robotic gripper. This is a using um, a property called jamming. If you've ever had a, a vacuum sealed container of coffee. You've seen this in action. When you take, when you open up the container of coffee, it lets all the air in and beans can suddenly slide past each other. It goes from a hard brick to a soft, sort of fluid-y bag, where the, the mechanics are much more like a fluid than they are like a solid. So that property is called jamming, that if you take the space away from irregular component, they like irregular bits. Um, they don't have to be irregular, but they have to be jagged enough to not want to slide past each other. If you take all the air out, all the space they can use to slip by each other, the thing solidifies. So this gripper can actually squish itself over hundreds of different kinds of parts, and they take the air out, vacuum, grips, they release the vacuum, it lets go. So these are the architecture problems that I'm, I'm talking about solving with the software about. You've got an arbitrary input. It can be anything from a pair of scissors to a piece of food, and you want to get a known output. You want to get forward motion, or you want to get a thing that can deliver a thing onto a spot. Maybe that spot's not precision to the nanometer. But when you're talking about gross movement, when you're talking about, I want something to move forward, it doesn't have to move forward in a beeline trajectory. It needs to move forward, though, no matter what the terrain is. I need something to grab something, no matter what that thing is. It doesn't have to be placed to the nanometer, but I need to grab it. This is sort of the architecture that I'm talking about. Next, please. So 
I, I like the, there's an interview with Bruce Lee where he talks about how good kung fu is done. And he often talks about how you've got to flow like water. Um, he, he has a long thing about this, and I think it's Fist of the Dragon. But uh, he has a long lecture with one of his opponents who, for some reason, stands around while listening to a lecture from Bruce Lee in between ass beatings um, about how he can beat the guy up with a, a bendy stick because the bendy stick is bendy and bendy is good. It's, it's, a, it's not the best argument in the world, but since it's delivered with fists, it's, it, it improves it. The good step is for the other. Um, but that's sort of the paradigm where it's actually difficult to get most robots to think of an RC car to adapt to an unknown environment, to an unknown environmental condition like a slope or a ramp. Or it actually takes engineering more of the dynamics of the system to be able to handle arbitrary stuff like that. There's a rock in the way. Most creatures on Earth can cope with rock in the way. Not every creature on Earth, like it so you know, terribly in their individual lifetime, cope with a rock in the way. But sea urchins do. They, they have uh, they have few moving parts. They have two feet underneath that are able to handle a huge number of environments incredibly readily, weathering storms and huge tides and things. They have to because that's their environment. They have to cope with that. But they also have to be energy minimal because they don't have an infinite amount of food supply. They're filter feeders. Well, they're not urchins, filter feeders? Sponges are filter feeders. Urchins are predators. I forgot about that. Sorry, urchins are, urchins are <laughs> sea going tanks that are also predators. They exude their stomach on things. Um, next slide. Uh, so, why should you listen to me? I'm a guy standing up at a conference that's not the big conference, it's the small conference. I'm here in the alternate conference, um, which should mean I'm even more of a crackpot than anyone else. But, um, I'm actually a, a soft roboticist who's published quite a few works, quite a few working robots. So these are two of my creations. One of them is called the Trekwell, sort of the simplest robot I could come up with um, that could be completely seamless. No gluing, no stitching, just a completely seamless hollow skin with structured voids inside. And this is an extension of that same technology, a thing called the Glaucus, which is a quadruped. It's a working, walking quadruped that only uses two inputs. So it does all of its arms and its legs, it essentially does a gecko walking maneuver, which is diagonal feet do the walking, where you put your weight on two feet, and then you move your other feet and switch the motion up. If you've ever seen a gecko like walking across the ceiling, that's exactly what they do, except they flip gravity for suction using uh, Van der Waals force and spatulated hairs that do adhesion. But this is what I'm talking about when I'm talking about this architecture of simple and replicatable to do a lot of work. So these guys are one casting. So they're 3D printed molds to generate this. I made it in CAD, you know, SOLIDWORKS, lots of time, lots of frustration. But once I had the molds, the design work was done and baked into the model. So I have like dozens of these guys that are each just one casting. The way they go together is there's a wax core inside. And so I put the wax core, it has whole fastenings to get it into a specific spot in the mold. I pour the mold full of silicone, and it's done. Like I squeeze the wax out, I heat the thing up in some hot water and squeeze the wax out, and all the insides are now hollow. That's it. So this is a, a technique, unlike hard robotics in many ways, is available for mass production. So I can beg all of the engineering into iterations that the 3D printer, you know, 3D prints molds for me, so I make slight design changes, 3D printer prints molds. And when I finally have my locked-in design, I can extend that very far. So I can do things like make certain features parametric, like how much bend there is, do a couple different molds to try it out, and then when I get the successful one, my work is done as a designer. So, next slide. Um, can you hit play on this video? I wonder, I hope our audio is not hooked up. And, ah! So I'm also the lead roboticist for a company called Bond. So uh, the, 
this company, completely different paradigm of robotics, but to prove that I, I do have some robotics jobs here. Um, it's actually a note writing robot. What we do is we take your handwriting, so we take it from a form that you submit, duplicate your handwriting as a series of, of strokes, essentially a font, um, with some modifiers for like pressure and all sorts of other things that make your handwriting unique, and then have an automated feeding, unloading robot to just make notes of it. So yeah, that's the that's the company that I work for. Those are the those are the things that I do in in my day job. Because certainly, soft robotics, you know, being an independent researcher in soft robotics doesn't pay very well. <laughs> All right, thanks a lot. And you might have to like. There we are. So um, there are a bunch of different kinds of soft robotics right now. Like in the last two years, I have some Google alerts and some Twitter alerts set up for words like soft robotics and compliant robots. And the, the huge jump in the last couple of years is pretty amazing. There are a bunch of studios that are now doing different kinds of research into soft robotics. Part of it is that you know, it's hit critical mass, sort of the Wikipedia effect, where like once Wikipedia starts, it's not terribly useful. It's only useful once there are enough articles on there to start being cross-linked. Another thing is that there's a lot of excitement for biomimesis in research, so there's a lot of investment for people doing, like, how can we recreate nature's solution for this? How can we recreate a heart valve? How can we replace a limb with something that's much like a limb? And there's also lots of ways that we're trying to integrate things into the body um, that can't be anything but soft, and so this is the only area the research is going to come from. I worked with a couple of people who were trying to wrap parts in electrostimulus devices. So there were little electrodes that wrapped around a heart to au completely automate the heart's pumping action. So oftentimes, a uh, myocardial infarction, like a portion of the heart, dies because of lack, lack of blood flow. But uh, the heart is self stimulating. So if a portion of it dies, the rest of the heart might be completely valid, but the signal flow for the heart is messed up. And so having a regular heart rhythm after you've had tachycardia once is really difficult unless you take the automation out. So what heart, uh, what pacemakers are for is to restart the heart if it fucks up. It's to restart the rhythm if it's fucked up, trying to push that natural rhythm on it. But what the silicone wrappers for a heart that are embedded with electrodes are for is completely, you map the heart, you do a 3D map of it, this is relatively straightforward from a CAT scan. The heart is isolated from the rest of the body, it's not connected by a fascia to anything else. So wrapping it in the silicone skin is relatively straightforward. You can map the motion of the heart because that's actually a known science. We have electrocardiograms for that. And so having electrodes pilot individual portions of the heart based on the exact timing with the tiny chip inside of your body is actually pretty straightforward. It's an exciting time to be in robotics. So uh, my company is super releaser. What I specialize in trying to do the seamless silicone casting things is the, the thing I'm most excited about is the computational part of soft robotics where you can make a whole bunch of different versions, test them, try them, split them into subgroups and categories, and get a lot of work out of a small amount of human effort. That you can create a design architecture, like here's a parametric design, or here's an evolutionary algorithm, or here's something I'm using to prototype different potentially successful robots. You know, good work. Um, I was wondering, how far are potential simulators related to testing in reality? So, so have, would it be possible to, do you have simulation software to, to test the... I have gross simulation yeah. software to do a lot of like twisting, bending, expansion, contraction. The difficulty is the complexity of the simulation. Elastic simulation is really memory intense. So I can get estimates on like how much force something's going to have inside of it, but exactly what it's going to do when bent is actually a much more complicated simulation than I'm familiar with. Like, I do mechanical simulations as part of my job, you know, as an engineer, mm -hmm. but it would take an expert who's really good at elastic simulations to get something that they're confident and represents the real world. Yeah. It is done, but it's sort of beyond my skills. Isn't, I mean, isn't this your point? Just like experiment with real world materials, yes. like different physical effects that you identify from nature, and just get on with the experimenting. Yes. Than, yeah. that's, why, that's why I have, like, why I have such passion. Um, I was going to say boner, but that's not terribly perfect. Um, that's why I have. 
I, it's why I have the passion for this particular method, though there are many methods for making software bus. My passion for this particular method is that it's it's pretty computational, where you can have, it, I, I'm lazy. I'm, I'm creatively lazy, but I'm lazy. I don't want to glue a robot together. I don't want to do that. That seems like a waste of my time. Uh, what I want to do is come up with a method that the robot is already together by the time I take it out of the mold. And if I can print a mold in like two halves that just print on the 3D printer, and all I have to do is put them together, then it saves so much of my time that I can get on with designing things. Or if the design isn't successful, I haven't lost much time. And if there isn't much inaccuracy in like how you glue those guys together, if how you glue it together determines whether it works, I don't want to be responsible for tracking down how I screwed up. I would rather that be totally baked into a design I can tweak. So that's what I do at SuperLaser. There's another company called OtherLab that's taking things in a completely different direction. So um, OtherLab is uh, one founded by Saul Griffith. He was uh, one of MacArthur Genius Grants a little while back. He um, was one of the core guys on Instructables, and then Makani, which makes uh, high-energy kites. They, the idea is to take turbines and put them on the kites and fly them into the troposphere so they can collect high-altitude winds. Which is an interesting idea. There are a lot of if, there are a few engineering challenges behind that, right. but it's an interesting idea. The material science part, plastics that can resist solar radiation, that's like that's like ninety percent of the problem. Um, but they're doing the completely other thing, where they have sewn robots, where they actually create cloth patterns, and the cloth patterns have uh, essentially pockets in them that, when they get inflated, will rigidize, and so you can have creatures that are sort of in a neutral pose and then have rigidizing elements that cause them to move when inflated. So you put a, you know, you sew something together like you'd sew a parachute. When the cloth is inflated, you have very tensile, high tensile strength fabric, like kite fabric, ripstop nylon. And then when it's inflated, that tensile strength actually turns into compressive load bearing. So that the air pressure, PSI, uh, essentially turns into your cross section and your PSI equals the amount of load that your bar can handle. You know, it turns it into an IV. Which is, an, it's like an inside out thing. If you take the same calculation, you can do it for a tube. But it's, a, it's another way of doing this same brand of thing where you're not relying on the hardness of the robot to win, you're relying on the compliance of the robot to win. You know, their robots, you know, can lift because it's air pressure power and PSI is often really advantageous in like elevating the amount of power that you use. Um, they can lift a lot for being weighing very little. Like they have a robot that can lift a human being. It's called the ant roach, and it weighs about 20 pounds, and it can lift a human being and walk. Um, it's about uh, five feet tall. Uh, the White Science Lab is doing something is doing some of the most fundamental uh, software box research that's up around right now. They're using multi-layer silicone castings. And Festo, who you might have seen, they do a lot of like soft grippy robots. They're a robotics company that makes like really elegant flying penguins and things. They, they do a lot of impossible looking stuff. Sorry. No worries. So next. All right. There are other things that do the same kind of stuff I'm talking about. You know, you can find examples of people like putting a robotic uh, servo on origami. You can find people making air muscles. Uh, those are, you wrap a, uh, a uh, cloth around a rubber tube and you play it with air and because the cloth will shrink because of the diameter of the tube, it can actually get a whole lot of power. I think it's called a minor muscle. But you can get a whole lot of power out of a small amount of pressure. Um, but uh, sorry, what's the spelling of minor? I think it's M-E-Y-E-R. Um, uh, I will probably update this up. I will probably I'm gonna make the slides available, but I'll probably update them with more information because these slides were written fairly quickly. Um, <laughs> next one. So, why do soft? Um, I already talked about this. Next one. <laughs> so, uh, I like talking about the natural world. Biomimesis is a great goal. But it shouldn't be the end goal. It shouldn't be copying nature exactly, because that's, that's sort of missing the point. The point is to engineer solutions, which is what nature is doing. But nature has its own methodology for doing this. Nature isn't trying to come up with the best solution. It's kind of coming up with the best solution modulo nature. So he can't go from zero to eyeball. It's got to go from like zero to a little patch of light sensitive skin to a little, you know, pocket sensor to like you don't get there in one step. And so you don't find ideal engineering solutions for the problem. You usually find a series of cludges that work all right until you have enough cludges on top of themselves that they look like an elegant system. Like the 
No one would ever, starting from zero, no one would ever structure the mammalian brain the way that they do. The occipital lobe that receives data from your eyes is in the very back of your brain. You have about a foot of cord going from the back of your eyes all the way to the back of your brain that carries all the data that you see. Additionally, the foveate in your eyes, the most sensitive part of your eyes, um, is where all of the nerves are. Right in, right on the border of the phobia, the most sensitive part, the most innervated part, is complete dead zone because all those nerves have to bundle somewhere to get back. The most sensitive your part of your eye is right next to the least sensitive part of your eye. So it goes. Uh, you can actually do this experiment if you want to do this with me. What we can do is hold one thumb out and stare at it with your eye. I and keep your eye on the thumb that you put out. Put your other thumb next to it. Keep staring. To move that other one to the left. And you will find, if you're using your left eye, that there's a dead spot about a pencil's width away from your thumb. Anybody? Keep one thumb still, so close right eye, but have right arm, right thumb. Oh no. <laughs> yeah. Oh, that's weird. Yeah. Most people don't notice it because your brain automatically fills that in with stuff. You don't see your dead spot. It just fills in. It's, it just does, you know, Adobe's content aware fill. <laughs> so we're not trying to replicate nature. We're trying to use nature to look at good solutions. We're looking at how do creatures that evolve separately come to parallelisms because they're design, because design exists essentially in this platonic universe where you can't survive if you don't do this and this. So it doesn't matter how you do it, just do it. So separated by millions of years, our eye and an octopus eye is actually very similar, though they sh don't share an evolutionary ancestor. Our closest common ancestor existed before eyes of any kind. But you have design problems out there in the world, like there's this data source called light. What can you do to process this data source called light? So next. Um, nature isn't always elegant. Um, I would play a YouTube video here, but that was such a nightmare last time. Just <laughs> Suffice it to say, not always the best solution, but good to look at. It was, it was a landscape of space. Um, so I'm gonna, like the, the majority of what I'm trying to get to in this talk, and it's very long and broad, um, is there are some problems out there that nature does with soft. They're actually very hard to do hard. So they're very difficult problems for us to do in the current paradigms that we use to construct things that actually you can do in the methods I've been talking about, like stitching tank fabric together, like casting a silicone robot, that you can get things like gradients and hardness to distribute force around something. So my prime example is squid beaks. So squid beaks, a squid is made of gel. Squid is way down on the barometer scale. The barometer scale is this arbitrary scale, sort of like Fahrenheit, where it goes from stuff that's about jello to stuff that's about hard hat. It's a way of usually talking about plastics and rubbers. A squid is like on one on the barometer scale. It's about as hard as jello. It's a little bit harder than jello, but about there. A, its beak is somewhere around 40 or 50, like the plastic in a hard hat. It's a very big difference. And if you went from one to the other rapidly, if you just put a, a beak in jello, it would pop right out. It's somehow able eat, to eat fish, which actually have, if you've ever cut through a fish with the scales on, you know the fish are actually fairly hard. The scales, especially, are somewhere also around a 40 on the barometer scale. How is the squid able to eat something that is harder than the muscle that makes up the surrounding tissue to be? That's an interesting design problem that's very difficult to do. How do you take a robot made of jello and have it hold a hammer? But it does it, and the way that it does it is actually gradating pressures of chitin. So what happens is the beak is surrounded by individual layers of chitin. So that chitin is just a water-bearing protein. And it can bear different ratios of water depending upon how it's structured. And so what it does is it, the squid radiates the force of using its beak out from the central point where all of the pressure is, all on this hinged beak structure. And it radiates it out to distribute it across the entirety of the body. It distributes it across the mantle and it also has a feather like chitinous bone inside of it. It's doing a difficult problem by layering and distributing the force over an incredibly soft body. Why doesn't it need its own face when it eats? Because it's able to distribute all that force. Next one. So, spiders. Did you know that spiders and cat crawlers? 
earth movers have a lot in common. They're both hydraulic. So spiders are hydraulically powerful. Um, they have this, uh, this hand body construction uh, where they have a book lung. It's a thing that moves this substance called hemolymph around. Hemolymph is just general purpose goo. So bugs are filled with, most insects uh, and arachnids are filled with general purpose goo that does the job of fighting infection, of pumping oxygen, of care, often carrying semen. Um, all in one general, we have a lymphatic system that does like a lot of the moving goo around, and then we have a blood system that moves the air around. So they have a pressure generating mechanism inside themselves called the book lung. It's the heart and the lung all in one. And that generates pressure spikes. They use those pressure spikes instead of bending muscles around to act incredibly rapidly, more quickly than their insect prey can. So reaction times are often determined by how innervated you are. So like a, uh, a crayfish's tail is actually more innervated than the human eye. So it's, that's a big thing. Um, so what ends up happening is crayfish, is, uh, crayfish don't have much brain. They don't have much uh, nervous system. What they know is that like bad thing coming and I gotta get away from this. Well, a lot of your signaling speed is about signaling strength when it comes to neurons. Thicker the neuron bundle, the more potentiated, the more opportunity it has to be one solid connection between two mechanisms. Because if you know how neurons work, they're often questioning each other all the time. There's little bits of neuronal firing that they're using to stitch up the network. Wide bands of, of neuronal traffic between two small inputs, like, is this bad? Yes, it's bad, flex this muscle. I'm afraid they shoot, they have one reaction to bad things, which is flex the tail muscle and get away. They have this huge nerve bundle going through the tail, and that makes it incredibly fast, which is great if you can be a thick, chubby creature, like a crayfish with a big chubby tail. Insects can get away with this, and spiders can get away with this. They can't be thickly enervated, not only because they have tiny little nervous systems, but also because they are small, and oftentimes because the, they're single nerve fibers connecting the various muscle fibers. So how do you be faster in terms of response time than the bugs you're trying to attack? The solution is to centralize your motor processing. Spiders actually have a distributor cap for all of their legs. So their legs are actually sprung to pull in. This is why when you pierce a spider with a pin, or if you dehydrate a spider, or if a spider dies and all the water comes out of it, it'll curl up. The reason that is that its arms start out in the curled position, and it's actually hydraulic pressure that causes them to come out. So all of their motion, left, right, in, out, is actually done from a central little hub inside of their cephalothorax, the one head body thing. That's how they outspeed bugs, is because they have more efficient processing with them. That's it. I mean, it's more complicated than that. Obviously, they weave webs and they hide and they have all sorts of other mechanisms. But I'm making a point here making a stand. <laughs>
how it does it. But it does what it's supposed to do with a fairly low impact on something that's important to the creature, which is how much muscle do I need to have? How much complexity can I sustain? And how does this mechanism break down? Can it be repaired? Well, if it's, it's made of cartilage and relatively soft skin, if cut, can be repaired. It's made of a triggered mechanism in which only two muscles power all of this motion. It's not several different muscle groups powered at different times with high fidelity processing, which you know, neurons can do. It's not that neurons can't do high fidelity processing. It's that when you need to do something quick, it's better to bake it into mechanisms. You know, gecko adhesion isn't the gecko's deciding to do dozens of things with its foot. It just has all these spatulated hairs on the bottom of its foot, which cause it to get, essentially have enough surface area to get close enough to another surface that van der Waals force starts coming into effect, where being in the near field of another atom uh, is, is a stable state, where it takes more energy to go further or to come back from being that close. Echinoderms. Echinoderms, starfish, um, I believe there's several other kinds of recognizable brittle stars and a couple other kinds of creatures you might be familiar with, but it's generally they use two feet for motion. They use hundreds and hundreds, sometimes in the thousands, of little feet to crawl along. They also do gross body movement. So if you've ever played with a starfish, you might see like an upside down starfish slowly roll itself over. But most of the motion is happening in these little tube feet that come up from underneath. It's actually able to generate a whole lot of force to, to capture its prey and eat it. Mostly clams, bivalves, things that need to be pulled apart to be eaten. The way that it does this is the two feet actually have a tremendous amount of surface area. They have surface area and they have suction going for them. So the starfish has two circulatory systems. The one circulatory system is a regular old echinoderm circulatory system. It's got a hemolymph-ish thing, a general purpose fluid for getting stuff around and growing. And it also takes in seawater. So it's got this thing called synthlate, and it's got a, actually got a water circulatory system inside it. And so what it does is the two feet each have a sheet of muscle that can bend them around. Each of the muscles isn't that strong. It doesn't have a very large cross section. But up inside the starfish is a little pump that can do positive and negative pressure. So what it can do is move the two feet of foot around in a vague and general way, using a very small amount of power, pop it onto something, and then use the pressure of the larger balloon inside of it to pull on that object. So it's able to maneuver all of these feet, all of this surface area. Well, here's exactly what I'm talking about all the feet, all the surface area, onto something like a clam and pry it open using the gross body movement structures that are going to be shown here in a second. So it's made of a series of bony plates that are each connected to each other with a protein that's actually kind of unique, especially compared to an most animal proteins, because it's a set it and forget it protein. So what ends up happening is this, this particular protein pulls the plates towards one another. So the starfish kind of starts out in a neutral position of it down and the two feet can pull it further down. But it's got this protein that if it set the protein in a particular position, it can actually hold that position without using more ATP. Here's the water circulatory system that I was talking about earlier, going out to a whole bunch of fluid sacs that each of them are responsible for a tube foot. So going through the magic and wonder of the starfish monorail system. <laughs> Yada, yada, yada. And what's interesting is, although it moves slowly, you can see this two feet operating down there, although it moves slowly, it's actually moving sort of in tandem with the speed of its ecosystem. High speed video of starfish and their prey crawling along the bottom of the sea is actually kind of fascinating because all of them move slowly starfish, urchins, clams, oysters. They're not moving at high speed, so there's this actually other biome of stuff that actually, like, starfish are chasing down like a smaller starfish, and they can both appear that they're not moving. But if it's time-lapse video, it might as well be a gymkata, where it's just <laughs> the sieve plate fluid circulatory system. Anyway, would you mind forwarding on to the next slide? I would if I could, but I can't. slides later is going to be helpful. Um, because these are the ways that you can do stuff with this general technology 
yourself, including innovating in it and getting a reputation for yourself, because almost nobody is doing it. And so the chance of being able to do something hugely impactful that people want to like interview you on television for, if they have me, um, <laughs> is actually really high. Uh, so I actually release all of my designs open source, so they can be downloaded, including the cat. Um, so it's not just like, here is a method to do it, but here's all the downloads, all the 3D printable files. And then I also have an errata of uh, errata, errata, uh, you or um, I have a running list of all the things that I fucked up. So if <laughs> yes, um, so I also published the here's what was a problem, here's how I solved it, here's how you know I investigated different materials, here's the material that I use now. Uh, running list because multi-beam casting is its sort of own source of bugbears, and it's it's vaguely a science. Um, and so get, just jumping into it is kind of hard, so I also have a whole lot of back data of like, here is how I tried to solve this problem, that problem. Um, the White Sides Lab actually recently published something called the Soft Robotics Toolkit, which is a very comprehensive, like they have motors and pumps and valves and circuits and a bunch of different robots to, to play with. So they essentially have a methodology for making really simple down-to-earth robots. That is actually a good, really good jumping off point, and, it, and they have two contests right now through Harvard, uh, with the total prizes of about ten thousand dollars for uh, professional and non-professional scientists uh, to submit designs. I don't know to who and who retains rights of them, but submit designs for soft robots that you can win giant prize money for. So I'm into that. Um, I don't know if I'm going to apply. Um, and then there's actually a method that I had never seen before, that I just saw like last week, um, for printing the soft robot volumes, the pressure volumes, a lot of these pneumatic soft robots are made with, directly in NinjaFlex. Have you heard of NinjaFlex? So it's a 3D printable FDM filament that you put on a maker bot, that you can put on you know, an a alternator, um, that is flexible. So it's, a, it's about the uh, diameter of the sole of the shoe. It's a little bit stretchy, but it's not super, super stretchy. It's not like silicone. And you can print in that. And then since you can't be absolutely certain that your surface is completely sealed, because the ninja flex is flexible, and there are all sorts of problems with you know, flexing away from different laminated layers, this particular designer who, uh, who is responsible for the instructable uh, dips the component in a combination of adhesive and solvent, which melts away a portion of the surface and infills holes. And the printed elements directly become the pressure elements inside of a soft robot. It's a really cool method, and it involves very little work to make a soft robot. So I, I think, as a like bargain basement, couldn't be less effort to make a soft robot. Like that's that's your game. So next slide, please. So that's me. That's that's me in a bandana. I mean. Um, <laughs> So I'm Matthew Borgatti, my uh, website portfolio of all that stuff is at Farms, and on the Twitter I'm at Giant Yes. Yay! Yay. 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 So, now begins question time. Huh? Yes, so. I would think that they're not, uh, that it's difficult to scale them to large, complex, something like that moves like human hand or something, mm -hmm. because you have to have loads of cinematic stuff going in. Yeah. Is that a problem? Yeah. So that has been a problem. Um, that's a problem in prototyping. I'm trying to solve this in mm -hmm. production. So the, my problem has been I can fit lots of different cores inside of things. But the material I'm using has to be sol soluble in a way that I'm not going to kill myself. You know, I'm not super aggressive solvents, and in a way that I can do easily, cheaply. So I've been using wax. Um, I've been using jeweler's wax, which is relatively rigid. So it's like stuff a silicone mold full of different volumes that melt out and become pockets. But the disadvantage is that the material bends. So it'll bend towards gravity. So I, if I have something that takes a right angle, um, no matter how securely I hold it up here, because the hollow, the, the tube is going to be a hollow space inside of the mold after it's done, its cross section pretty much has to be round. Like I can't add too much structure to it, or that becomes its own pocket. Because what ends up happening is your your 
circumference of the cross area, your, your border length in your cross section, essentially becomes the volume of the bladder. And so I can't add like a structural member in there to rigidize it. But what I can do is I've also been using a tin business alloy, of you know, stove top casting metal to make cores out of. That's less practical for me in like a prototyping context because the tin business alloy traps bubbles easier, the flashing is harder to work with because it's more time consuming. But in a production context, tin business alloy is actually used a lot for medical devices where they need to have like a nylon part that has like a view in it. You know, things that have uh, like a threaded valve that's part of that component. So they'll use this multi-part casting process where they do just the same thing. They cast the plastic to thermosetic. So once it's uh, cast at a certain temperature, the temperature that it takes to melt or burn it is substantially higher than its casting temperature. And you can put, you can find a specific alloy of a low temperature melting castable alloy to inject in there, and then you can melt it out in an oil bath after the fact and reclaim all that metal. So I've been doing that at, with some experiments, and I think in a production context that makes sense. But in a home fabrication context, it's not terribly practical. I've been trying to engineer my way around it. Not quite there yet, but I, I, I'm sensitive to that issue. Like I want to, I want to stuff things full of different art points of articulation that become, there becomes a, an area of diminishing returns that I can't prototype yet. But obviously this strategy is really about failing fast and experimenting yes. a lot with lots of stuff. So what is your balance between automating those prototypes and experimenting with them and, and designing them? Like mm -hmm. so experimentation versus design, like where on that slider bar do you yeah. play? Well since I'm going to be all doing all the work I design for myself, um, I'm very sensitive to how much time it takes to iterate. So I do a lot of parametric modeling from SolidWorks. So I try to do a lot of sketching beforehand, figure out what I'm aiming for in design, what I'm trying to experiment with, and where my parameters need to be, wall thickness, number of cells inside of this shape, um, what my, like, how much the pockets that are going to, like, wax folds that are going to form the pockets inside of, like, something like the block is, how much they're going to weigh, how big those are going to be, so what does that mean for how big my tubes are going to have to be to get air into those and things like that? Try to sketch out all of those things and then create parameters inside of the cat. And then my usual architecture is I have the cat have one way of slicing up a mold, and then no matter how I change the base cat, the mold more or less stays the same. And so I can make a bunch of generations by twisting variables around. Since I own a 3D printer, I buy it. Am I reaching the end of my time? No, but we've got a WebEx session that needs to be put together in about 10 15 minutes. Perfect. Yeah. But we're about to do the closing ceremony in about five minutes, so. Oh. But just, <laughs> I can wrap up a little bit. Just, no, 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 this is what you've got to say, honestly. You've heard closing ceremony so far. Nothing to announce for your well. You're happy. I'm happy, yes. <laughs> Excellent. Uh, so, I start because it's highly tied to my background. I start with parametric CAD, like in baked into my method. Mm -hmm. um, I've been trying to pair with people like nervous systems who do generative algorithms, because that would be another way to like pop off hundreds of molds, automate them, put them through a training process. There are other ways of doing what I'm doing, like there are ways you can create units and like Lego units for soft robots and plug them together to figure out what shapes you're talking about. I haven't characterized a lot of the things I'm working with, so oftentimes like I'm fighting my way into the wind with trying to like characterize how much durometer on the silicone equals how much pressure when I have this amount of cross-section with these rims. You know, there are a lot of things that I'm still just sort of playing with and not characterizing. So one thing that could really be an advantage is actually experimenting to characterize the system that I'm working with and like chopping off bits of experiments to be like, oh, this is to deter determine these particular features. And that would also help me, like, that would help me go forward in, in many ways as well as essentially archiving all properties that I'm working with. Right now, it's still very much in a sketching phase mm -hmm. and using the things that I'm most comfortable with and 
like many hackers, like I, I love the program that I use, I love the product relationship with the program that I use, and a lot of my side projects are, ex are excuses to stay behind it. Yeah. Uh, you were talking about uh, walking through air pressure, air muscles, and all this stuff. Yes. This uh, air has to be compressed somewhere and uh, stored yes. and taken with the yeah. The system. elephant in the room. How is uh, how is this uh, energy that I have to put into this system compared to batteries and yes. electricity? Is it That's, better or? That's a relevant question. Uh, how how efficient is it relative to a battery? Um, well, in terms of joules per gram, um, convert, conversion into uh, motion batteries can be more or less efficient battery to battery for how many watts they actually have. Um, I think that's their C rating. Um, but on the back of an envelope calculation, I took a uh, CO2 cartridge uh, that can fire paintballs. The calculation that I did was CO2 cartridge can fire this many paintballs at this speed. I know the mass of the paintball and I know the speed. And before running out of CO2, can do this much. So I have joules. Um, batteries also, if you look on certain websites, you can find a joule rating. Joules per gram, a CO compressed liquid CO2 cartridge has about two orders of magnitude more power than a double A battery. Now, how convenient that is, how it gets distributed in the system. Obviously, I think you can't get away without computation. There's not like an air computation system that I can use. So for making a remote device, for making like a crawling robot that has no power source off board, that it's all contained, like has the you know, scorpion's tail with a compressed CO2 cylinder in it, I still have to use electronics to, to control balance and do remote control, things like that. But I believe, and I haven't built the systems to fully realize it yet, but I believe that I can get huge efficiencies over traditional robots in terms of I can use compressed liquid gases. I can use gases that you know are liquid. You get a phase advantage when you compress a gas down into a liquid. Um, it starts taking up much less volume for having a huge amount of potential energy. Um, I think that you can get huge efficiency advantages on that because in a flat on paper it seems to have a whole lot more energy storage capacity. Sure. I'm not the best mathematician in the world. Um, I, I caveat all of that with it will prove itself when I actually build a physical device to test it because on paper it seems very plausible but it'll take actual bench testing. So yeah, I think that wraps it up for me, unless anyone has anything else. Really. So I think it's you're in time for closing ceremonies. <laughs> okay.